Good evening and welcome. My name is Dalit Horn and I'm the Executive Director at the Vilna, Boston Center for Jewish Culture. The Vilna serves as a central hub for arts, culture, and Jewish life. We bring people together to build community and experience Jewish culture through art, film, history, literature, cooking, adult learning, and so much more. When we reopen our physical doors later this year, we hope you'll join us in our newly renovated historic synagogue in Beacon Hill. As we marked the anniversary of Yom HaShoah last week and Passover the week before, we were quite recently reminded of the incredible importance our tradition places on the acts of remembering, retelling, and connecting the stories of the individuals and communities that link us. Tonight, we are gathered here to hear from author Hadassah Lieberman, who will discuss her new book, Hadassah, An American Story. If you wish to purchase her book, we have pasted a link into the chat box with instructions for how to do so. I would like to thank Hadassah Brandeis Institute for all their tireless work on this event. Hadassah Brandeis Institute is proud to be involved in this event as one of the editors, Lisa Fishbane Jaffe, of the HBI series on Jewish women at Brandeis University Press, which is publishing this book. And a special thank you to the Jewish Women's Archives, the Holocaust Museum of Los Angeles and the Illinois Holocaust Center and Museum for their assistance in promoting this event with us tonight. Please take a moment at the end of tonight's program to fill out a quick survey. We'll paste it into the chat right now and again at the end of the program. The way tonight will work in just a moment, I will hand the virtual microphone over to moderator Sylvia Neal. She will interview Hadassah Lieberman for about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions from you, our audience. Hadassah Brandeis Institute Director, Lisa Fishbane Jaffe, will be facilitating the Q&A section of this program. If you'd like to submit a question, please type it into the Q&A box. We have pasted the speaker's full bios into the chat. And now without further ado, I hand the virtual mic over to Sylvia. Thank you so much. And thank you each and every one of you for being here today. I'm Sylvia Neal. I'm actually on the board of the HBI, um, one of the publisher, the publisher of today's book. And it is a pleasure to greet you all here today. It's my pleasure to also introduce to you Hadassah Lieberman. 
Hadassah Lieberman was born in Prague to Holocaust survivors and emigrated with her parents to the United States when she was nine months old. She grew up in Gardner, Massachusetts, the daughter of a rabbi in a small town America. Hadassah went on to have a rewarding career dedicated to healthcare issues, assisting nonprofit organizations, improving educational standards, and promoting international understanding with a particular focus on global women's health. She has been a member of the Parents Music Resource Center, chair of the Ambassadors Ball for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and honorary board member of the Society of Women's Health Research. A wife, mother, political campaigner, and renowned public speaker, with her husband, Senator Joe Lieberman, she co-authored an amazing adventure, Joe and Hadassah's personal notes on the 2000 campaign, and is the author of a new moving memoir, Hadassah, an American Story, published by the Brandeis University Press. Hadassah, welcome. It is an honor to be with you today. Hello. Hello, there thank you are. You. I'm here. Technical moment. Uh, but thank you. I just want to say before we start that the music that you just played, you know what it hit me? That my start story starts, you know, the 48 and that dark period of clouds. And when I listen to your beautiful music, it really brings a tear to my eye because that's where we are today. That's how we are, so strong and beautiful. So thank you. Well, this is in a way something we share. We both share a background as children of Holocaust survivors and having without, with some amount of pride, I can, can say successful lives here in the United States. And your memoirs begin with a poignant quote from Ellie Wiesel, who I know you were friends with, quote, that whoever listens to a witness becomes a witness. How did the Holocaust and being a child of survivors affect you and your perspective toward life? Ooh, <laughs> knowing that I was the child of survivors of the Holocaust and most of my family members had been killed or in Siberia and then immigrated from that area to Israel and became citizens there. A whole series of stories and poignant memories. I, I was always raised knowing that and yet my parents always emphasized have to go forward and grow and educate and become professionally knowledgeable. So I was raised coming out of that and yet we were never stuck in that domain. So it was a mixed, so for me to sit down and have written this book now was my way of catching up with beginnings and the 2021 songs of joy that we're able to sing today on behalf of us all. Well, and indeed you title your book Hadassah, an American story, mm -hmm. not a Holocaust survivor child's story, although that's all encompassing in that, right? And in reality, it is an immigrant story. So let's go back a little bit to what that transformation from, as you point out in your book, Darkness to Light, um, was about. What was it like being an immigrant in small town United States in the 1950s and 60s? And why did you specifically choose that title? Well, coming to this country, I was a baby when we came. So I don't remember the stories my mother told me of everyone being seasick on the boat and my dancing with the captain. I was the only one, she said, who wasn't sick. And coming to this country and the stories I remember hearing when I was older that the Statue of Liberty greeted them as they came to the shores 
And my mother was so taken by Emma Lazarus. And coming here, I didn't know any English. I only knew Yiddish. And coming to kindergarten, was a to it was Gardner, Massachusetts, a half hour from New Hampshire, mostly a small Jewish community, mostly Christian town. The only immigrants there were French Canadians from Canada who had settled in that area because of their problems that they'd had in Canada. And the rest of us were, you know, I had to, I had to learn English because that's all anyone spoke except for some of the French. And I learned English to be able to communicate to my fellow comrades in kindergarten and the big, big baskets that they held over our heads to reach up and grab a little candy or a little toy. That made me feel, oh my goodness, they give this out. Oh, I'm in America. And my parents always brought me to Memorial Days and July 4th, we went, we were the most patriotic. We went to all of those events and it was, the way that I felt, I was an American, even though I had to help my mommy do her checks or her bills or talk to a doctor and speak more fluently and then hand the phone over to her or give her the message. That was the way it was. And I was, I was an American, but my mommy didn't want me to dress like an American. And she, we don't eat American foods. We have our own Czech this dish and Hungarian that dish. So that it was always a combination of things. I was supposed to be an American and yet there were certain things that they did not want me to give up. Well, you wear your hair in braids or you put your hair up in a ponytail. All those you know, things I read about later that were part of different customs and different times. So I just felt, and it was an American adventure. I came out of darkness, the blackness, and I began to store light. And I kept going forward and the light became brighter in my life until that was who I was and where I was and what I was, even though we all have our difficult moments whether that's divorce, remarriage, you know, these are the changes some of us have as part of the American adventure. Yes, well, that is very true. And before I get to, to following up on that last part of your sentence, I can't get out of being the political person you are, but I do wanna know because this um, story of America being the nation of immigrants, um, how does your personal history and your long experience in the political sphere inform your views on immigration today? What advice do you have to our leaders today? Well, I've always felt that America was a genuine home for immigrants. That was always the case. People died to come to the United States. And when we came here, it was the only place of freedom. Now, Israel was there, that was also a thought, but my mother didn't want to go. There had been a war, you know, around that period of time. And so we decided, my dad had uh, studied for the rabbinate when he was in Prague, in not Prague, in his area, Czechoslovakia. And we came to this country at a time when there were many different immigrants, many different skin colors, all of us coming together. And it was an American story because I felt while I had been born abroad that I was very much of an American citizen simultaneously. Even though when my dad registered me, to be in the town of Gardner, registered people who were immigrants. And my name in Czechoslovakia, my, when my father went to sign me in at my birth, 
he told them Esther was my name. And at that time, the Czechs said, oh, you can't have the name Esther. That's German name. So my father said, okay, Hadassah will be her name. Then we came to Gardner, Massachusetts, eventually after the boat in Brooklyn and all that, and came into Gardner and the Catholic nuns who were helping out with the registration said to my father, okay, Rabbi, what is her name? So my father said, well, I want to change it back to the name we were originally going to give her, Esther. And the nun looked at my father and said, Rabbi, you must keep it Hadassah. That is so unusual. So those are American stories. We're a blend of all of it. And I have all to say, as, as they are, as I told you when we were talking the other day, your story is so much like my own family story. Yes. And actually, your own personal arc in life is so similar to my own arc in life. That touched me when you said that to me. Yes. And so, as I would say, including you, like my brother, we're born. Um, you know, not in the United States. I was the first one born here, but like yourself, I've been a career woman. You were a career woman, are a career woman, a mother who was divorced also like myself. And then, which is unusual for, I would say, Holocaust survivor children. Oh, absolutely. Right. Um, and then you became a political wife, had a very successful life. Um, I will include myself in, in that, a very happy married life. And when you married Senator Joe Lieberman, in case somebody didn't know who you were married to on this um, webinar, um, your son was seven and Joe's two kids were teenagers. And your book is replete, replete with personal wisdom and loving quotes from your children. And so speaking from my heart to yours, okay, because I understand this, how did you balance it all? How did you deal with the tricky personal situations and achieve such a wonderful blended family and such a, su a successful life in so many ways, particularly the personal? Well, I thank you for asking me that question. One of the hardest things I've done, me, myself, is blending a family is one of the things I talk about in the book is how important it is when you get divorced and remarried, you are meeting your husband or wife's child, children, and they are close, hopefully, to your spouse, so close that they're the skin, the arm, the, if, how can you marry a person? This is me talking, not judgmentally, how could you marry someone whose children are not totally accepted by you? We decided early on, none of this step stuff. These are our children because this is my husband and his children are my children, my children, his children. And I would never have thought about marrying someone who could not be close to our children. And that took time to blend. And there were many times that we had all kinds of little disputes or back and forth, or, you know, I know some of the kids, my two older ones would go down to, this, to the, our basement in New Haven. And my husband would go down there and talk to them and because they weren't they were upset and they didn't want this they didn't want that and the truth is kids get upset because after all they're losing a parent to be with at the same time because you get divorced so it's all of those things one of the hardest parts of my life was bonding with a family and one of my best accomplishments is bonding with the family. I love all my children and I feel totally close to all of them equally. 
And my husband and I do everything the same for each one. And my husband's known as Poppy by all of them. And I'm known as Safta. So that's how we communicate with one another. Beautiful. And that, as I said, just right back at you, because I know how truly fulfilling having this bonus family and having oh. this one family all together, is, it, it is. And I love that you have this one book. I yes. And um, if, if those on this webinar have not yet read it, um, aside from just getting to know you in this way, I really highly recommend that everybody read it through because you have such grace and style in giving um, wisdom to it all um, and how you get through the bad hair days, so to speak. Um, and deal with parents, right? because this is, I mean, to my parents, to your parents, I, they couldn't, you know, they didn't believe this. Like they didn't think I would ever get divorced, but I never thought I would get divorced. And yet we have to cope with things. We have to move forward. I see so many instances where some, women in particular, whose parents have been so negative and not helping them lift themselves up and go forward, have really failed at life and given their children every family event they have is miserable. If you can't go beyond it, you can't give your children a decent, colorful, happy life. And yourself too. And yourself too. And so... How did you meet Joe? Oh, well, when I was at Stern College for two years, and that was another American experience, when I was thinking of where I'm going to school, and I had several places in mind, and I'll never forget, my father took me to Boston, and at one point I was thinking I would major, I wanted to major in modern China, minor in theater education. And my father walks me in to look around at several colleges. And there I was. And my father looked around and saw these couches with these couples sitting and kissing, or, you know, that thing. And my father looked at me, this is not for you. So he said, you must come and you will spend two years at Stern College, which is part of Yeshiva University. And then you will decide what you want to do next. So I ended up in Stern College and um, I'm talking so much to the side that I'm thinking, I'm losing your question, about, which was to about meeting your husband, meeting Joe. Yeah, so, so, so I ended up going to Boston University. Then my husband and I met through my roommate who had been my roommate at Stern and she knew him from her synagogue in New Haven. She wasn't particularly friendly with them, but she knew him. She said to me, he's a nice man. He's a politician, but he's a, he's a decent guy. He's good. That's how she introduced <laughs> him. That was so funny. So I, I, and then she said to me, and he looks like Gaetan. And I thought, well, that's an interesting next comment. So, you know, and I met him and he was in the middle of campaigning for attorney general. So we talked on the phone and he was campaigning. And finally, I went up to see my girlfriend and he came over to her house, met me. And then he said, what are you doing tonight? Um, do you have time to go out? Cause he said, I have campaigning tonight in a more remote town in Connecticut. And you're welcome to go with me and we can get together after, which was like 11, 12 o'clock at night. So what I did was I said, okay. And I asked him, now, how do you introduce me? So he said, I'll just say you're my driver. I said, <laughs> okay. I didn't say anything. And then we went on this evening to this fundraiser. And I just had to sort of, oh, hello. Oh, nice to meet you. Oh, I'm his driver or whatever. You know, it was like weird. So 
then we left that place and headed back to New Haven where we had uh, a nice evening and danced a little. And then after that, we went back to my girlfriend's house and talked to like 3 a.m. And then he had to go because he was campaigning in Hartford the next day, the next morning. And he called me and we kept finding times to see each other, but it would be after he would come driving down to Riverdale with his driver, Jimmy O'Connell, who was a cop during the day and at night would drive for years, had been driving Joe and his campaign. And um, it was really, we started falling in love. And my father, I'll never forget when he knew Joe was divorced and how many children does he have? Two and they're teenagers. And he said, you know, teenagers can make the parents crazy. Never mind someone who comes in. But I said, okay, daddy, well, I'll check it out. He said, just be careful and see. So we were dating and I met the kids, but you know, they're kids who don't know me. I was, I haven't been raised in the community or anything. And so we started to fall in love. And here it was during Joe's campaign for the Senate. So it was, it was crazy. Well, no, this was his, he, this was the election he did for attorney general. And then the next one was the Senate. So many things have happened. I can't remember. Them. And um, we got to the point where we did, he decided and we discussed it. Look, I want to have the wedding after the Senate campaign. I mean, after, not the Senate, the attorney general campaign. So we got married and our parents met and the kids, you know, we got to know them. But those were hard days. Those were hard times because my baby boy was seven. So he didn't have too much to say. He met Joe and Joe played Monopoly with him. So Eitan said to me after mommy, he played Monopoly with me and he didn't do it because of you. He did it because of me. So I thought, oh, well, this is good. But, you know, Joe's kids were older. And so it took time. It took a lot of effort and a lot of shutting your mouth. When yeah. you have something to say, you've got to let it go because it becomes more complicated and words stay. The only people you can talk to in a way you don't care, they won't remember is your mother and father. <laughs> but right. don't try doing it elsewhere, you know, until, so it takes a lot of silence and cleverness to make a new marriage work and, and last. And generosity. And, and generosity. generosity, absolutely. That's really what you get from reading the book and where that wisdom comes from of how to be giving. I, 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 I really yes. believe that. Now, you know, clearly what you're describing, if you're mixing up these campaigns, obviously you both have led enormously busy lives, including on the campaign trail and you and your husband, aside from making all the time for family in this wonderful, wonderful, amazing bonding way, You've also always made time for observing Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath. And indeed, your religiosity as a couple is widely renowned throughout the country. And in your campaigns has always been front and center, your pride in being Jews, your religiosity, your pride in being religious, and your observance. So what does your Jewishness mean to you personally and to your family? And how has that played out, you know, having Shabbat when you're in political life and so on? It, it has been an important gift, an important observance. It has helped us keep our family life together. It has helped us have our quiet time on a Friday night and Shabbat. And we had 
so many experiences. One that comes to my mind is we were in our first Shabbat in Kismi, I think it was, and in the campaign, the Senate campaign. And there we were, the Lubavitch rabbi had traveled for miles to deliver delicious Friday night food and Shabbat food. Wow. And he was so kind. And I said, Rabbi, thank you. Thank you. He delivered it on Friday at a long drive back. And I said, Rabbi, what can I do to thank you? And he said, you can ask your advanced person. She was from Florida, Jewish. And he said, could you ask her to light candles tonight for all of us, for herself? And I asked her and she was so overwhelmed by that experience and appreciated it. And the staff used to have a Shibuti lecture together because they called Shabbat Shibuti and they would go out at night because they we weren't bothering them about anything and we weren't <laughs> on the computers, or, you know, all that stuff. And it was, it was great fun. And Al Gore, who was running for the presidency when my husband was for the vice presidency, I will never forget saying to Joe, okay, Joe, you know, I've missed Sundays. Maybe what'll happen is I'll take watch on Saturday and you'll take my watch on Sunday. So we <laughs> laughed, it was so cute. That's but we, I, you know, our whole lives, I've, I've always felt very Jewish and my identity. And yet I've, you know, my garden in Massachusetts city was not New York. It was not, you know, so I'm accustomed to being with everyone with no questions. Right. And at the same time, I've always been who I am, where I am. And, and during the campaign, the Senate, I'll never forget, we're in the Midwest. And I just point out the Midwest as an example. These people were lined up trying to, you know, say hello, shake hands. And so many of them who did not happen to be Jewish for the most part said to me, I like your husband because he's a deeply religious man. Please tell him. I don't even know how they were voting, but those were the words. And I was so touched by that all over the country. Yeah. Another American story. Another American story. And as we've said, growing up myself in Toledo, Ohio, a little bigger, yes. but it was not like yes. New York, Los Angeles, or Chicago. And what I so admire and what you've been saying and what is throughout the book is how your strong identity not just gives you solace within your own religion and also a way of celebrating it opened your heart, your strong identity opened your heart to others. And right. uh, you were able it's to, you know, and, it's, and, and then you had a lot of practice at it too, because in Gardner, yes. you yes. know, it was, you know, you were out in that world. Anyway, you did mention again, that your husband, you know, ran as Al Gore's vice president. In yes. And uh, 2000. Yes, he won the popular. You guys won the popular vote. I want to remind people, but the U.S. Supreme Court intervened in the Florida recount, in resulting in the election going to George Bush. Now, it's impossible not to compare what happened that in that situation, oh, like oh. memories of you know of that of you know today and yesterday. So I'm going to ask you, what are your memories? both the good and the bad and the ugly of that campaign. And then I'm going to ask you as a follow-up, but let's talk about the campaign first, but you can think about it later. And what would you give, how would you give advice to the first Jewish vice presidential spouse, Doug Emhoff? <laughs> that, yeah, that experience was like no other I've ever had. Basically, your lives are taken over. What we had, again, Shabbat, we would get together with family on Shabbat, depending on where we were. 
or situations where friends might be in that city where we are for Shabbat. And we didn't have time to make it back on Friday. It was very, very special. And celebrating it that way was so much a part of our lives that even not to come to the end of the campaign, excuse me, my voice, so I'm drinking water, not to come to the end of the campaign, but that Friday when the Supreme Court had not, the vote hadn't happened and it was, it's the Supreme Court had been told they would have to decide and I will never forget that Friday night, Al Gore called us before Shabbat and said, oh, will you please come over to us on Friday night? Why don't you come over? So I packed my Shabbat food with paper plates, candles, kiddish cup, everything that we use for Shabbat, a challah cover. And we walked over, we, we rode over to their place. He had us picked up. And Tipper, it was scurrying. The staff was going nuts. We didn't know anything. We didn't know when this was going to end, when we would know. We walk in the house and Tipper tells Joe, because he wanted to daven. So they give him the room, a private room, which has the Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. And Joe, well, that, you know, that's their house, their tree. And Joe Davent, and then Tipper said, hey, you know, why don't we just not use our iPads and our iPhones? It's quiet and let's just enjoy this moment. So that was incredible. And we sat down and Donna Brazil was with us that night. And she sat down at the Shabbat table and we proceeded to do a little bit of the service and Kiddush and Hall and all that. And they really, enjoyed it. It was very, very special and nice. And then after Shabbat, we left our things there because it was Friday night. We didn't stay. We were going home. Al and Tipper said, why don't we walk you home? So there was the secret service in a van riding behind us as we walked down Wisconsin Avenue to go to where we lived. And it was an amazing moment. And then cars were going by and people were walking and they started pointing because they were shocked. And we got to our house, they dropped us off and the secret service drove them back to their residency. Those were the amazing moments that occurred all over the place. And Shabbat, the, the Kesher Israel Georgetown, the Orthodox synagogue there. Oh, they had, the, the secret service would be walking us down, you know, roads and people would come out of their houses to say Shabbat Shalom or have a good Sabbath. It was, it was wild. It was one of these unbelievable moments in time that happened. I mean, I, I think somehow it is symbolic because again, I mean, you all were heroes. I mean, the country was, you know, went into a transition, very peaceful, very dignified. And to have it in a sense be hallowed by what you're saying, by having this in particularly beautiful Shabbat that encompassed that whole crisis and time for the United States, you know, is very meaningful and very moving. And I think that, um, um, and as I said, you'll go down in history as American heroes, and that is a particularly symbolic Jewish and um, religious way of, I think, hallowing that experience forever and ever. So, 
you know, I'm going to uh, finish my section of asking because I see so many people want to ask questions. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Lisa in a, se in a session, in a section, a second. <laughs> yes, yes, I know, I know. And I'd see, um, that's why I'm taking my water. <laughs> I, I mean, I think we, we've gotten this impression, but I, did, I just wanted to, before we turn it over to other folks, to ask their questions. Why did you feel compelled at this point to write these memoirs? And, you know, what hopes do you have for an effect on our audience? When my mother died, and before that, I had picked up books. And one of the books, I didn't know what it was. And it was her diary written in the Czech language and from, and it said something like 1970. And I brought it to the Holocaust Museum, which, you know, we've all been close with. They're special in the DC. And, you know, tonight we have everyone included. It's very, very nice and very special. And I will never forget, I got the translation and it was my mother talking about from the diary and I reprinted it in the book about Auschwitz. And my father had been in slave labor camp and my mother had been liberated from Dachau. And it was incredible. And she wrote and she said, I cannot write anymore. I am counting on my children to speak more about this period. That was, I couldn't believe it. And I went through the campaign, this, that, and I just started thinking about it more and more. And I was gonna write it, I was gonna write it. And being out of the Senate and working on it for several years, it, it was tough, but I wanted, my purpose was to, have people not forget. I was just interviewed by a man on radio the other day, and he, who happened to not be Jewish, was saying he had read my book and he had followed with many different people their books or their stories on the Holocaust. And he always felt like there's never enough said about this. And people do not want to talk about it. They don't want to know all this horrible stuff. And it was so amazing to listen to him. And I know there's some truth in that because people don't want to hear, but that's part of our story. And that's part of the ugliness. And what is really horrible in my mind is that some of these awful stories continue in the world and people speak as if they don't, haven't learned the lesson that we can spread hatred to young people by teaching them how to speak in this awful way. So I did it and I also wanted to talk about divorce without any personalized thing, names and all of that. And I wanted to talk about immigration and my parents, their death and Auschwitz that I visited. What an incredible experience that was. And the 50th anniversary, you represented the United States. It was amazing. Went with Elie Wiesel. Yeah. And it was just an amazing experience. It's shocking when you go there and as many people as can go there before things break down more and who knows who's going to build it up sometimes it, it was it was an interesting experience that's where my father was yeah. okay. see same thing yeah that's it's just it's beyond and when you read some of the horrors that are in other people's books it hits me because there's some stuff that our families didn't talk about and now more and more stories are coming out by us, by we children who have gotten older. We are. 
It's our legacy to carry. carry yeah. forward. And with that, there are people who are waiting to ask you questions. I thank you for me being able to participate with you. I feel like such a connection. And now I'm going to ask Lisa to take it from here. And again, thank you. Okay. Thank writing. you. Thank you. And I hope, you know, once we get a little more time, we'll talk. Okay. okay. Don't forget that. I'm right here. We won't. Okay. Thanks. Well, thank you both for a wonderful discussion. Um, Hadassah, one of the things that is so impressive about the book is, is the structure of the book, that it's, it's your story, but it's also the story of members of your family that it incorporates, as you mentioned, the, your mother's memoir and also sermons from your father and comments from other family members. Um, can you talk a bit about how you chose to, to structure the book to include all those voices alongside your own? Do you know, that's, that was absolutely natural for me to think about doing. And I had some back and forths along the way, some very professional whatever were saying, well, you know, you write a book, you don't need others coming into that book. And why do you need your children? They just don't get it. I wanted to have the words of people I love and they love me. And even, you know, my, my kids wrote about divorce and the impact, but I felt that was critical because that teaches other people. So it, I never occur, it never occurred to me that I wouldn't include. I wanted to include more, but they, you know, I, I did here and there in the foreword and little quotes that were hard for me. They didn't want too many quotes. So I deferred, you know, some people have more expertise than me, but I might be more right than them. <laughs> So there are a number of questions about your early life in Gardner. Um, my, Michael Sharp sends his regards and says how much you look like your mom. Um, but oh, the, you're so sweet. Um, but there's a question, did you experience anti-Semitism in Gardner and how did you and your parents handle it? If you did. I never experienced anti-Semitism. When I was in fourth grade, a little boy said something about she's Jewish or something like that. It was some remark that was totally nothing, but the teacher kept him after school and said, you don't identify people. We're, you know, and that was like a real Gardner, Massachusetts thing to do, but there was nothing. And the other time my father was the head of the ministerial association. He was the only rabbi in town and there was a year that he was the head. But when he first came to Gardner, there was a minister who had some anti-Semitic comments to make on the radio when he gave his weekly speech. My father didn't like it. And he spent time just speaking with him and the funny part is that my dad got this minister to be a friend and he never did that again. So I really did not have anything. And that's, you know, that's the same during the campaign. There was one thing on the internet, the rest of the time we had nothing. Nobody said anything, nothing. Now, it's a different time today than it was in 2000, I guess. But I know there are a lot of Jews who said, oh, you didn't get any anti-Semitism? I said, no, we didn't get it through the campaign. We didn't get it. You know, we were strong at who we are and respectful and nice to everyone else. So uh, there's a question about dealing with anti-Semitism now. Um, you, you comment in the book that you see dark times and um, urge caution. How do you think we can combat the rise of anti-Semitism now in America? You know, it's such a mystery. And as we know, so many magazines, so many writers, so many books, so many people out there 
are trying to combat it and no one seems to have the absolute answer. I don't like this darkness. I'm not saying there's no light, but I don't, we never had any of this during our lifetimes in the United States. So I don't like it, but I think we have to go on, be strong, educate people and not be afraid. We are strong. We are not back to earlier times. And at the same time, there's been a reemergence of impossible talk for some people. And some people, the internet, as great as it is, and it's an answer to all our prayers, at the same time, it's crazy because some people who are weak and haters and they're the people that are getting together through various ways on the internet because it helps people talk to each other who maybe would be better off not finding each other to talk to. So I don't know what the answer is, but I do think that the answers that are being projected are important. And I also, I also think that my parents who were a different generation and had gone through what they'd gone through always emphasize to me, always be polite, always behave appropriately. And we as individuals, as Jews, as Jewish individuals are the PR for ourselves. And you have to remember what and how we project forward is taken in a negative way if it's a negative projection or behavior. So we just always, you know, I always think we're all entitled to everything, whether we're minority or majority. Simultaneously, minorities always have to be a little more careful because they're still minorities. Now, I don't experience what that when I go see my daughter in Israel, you know, who's made Aliyah, but that's a different country, different place with different problems. So you describe in the book, uh, you have a chapter about going to uh, the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz with the American delegation. Uh, can you talk a bit about that experience and what it meant to you? Yes. Oh, that was incredible. And we had an au pair then for Hani and our littlest one. And we, when we were in Washington and President Clinton's White House person in charge of Jewish events, affairs, called me and said, there is the trip to Auschwitz on the 50th. And I wanted to know if you would come as you know, the wife of Senator Lieberman and as the daughter of survivor from Auschwitz, if you would come and join us. So my first feeling was, oh, wow. And Hani was only, I don't know, she was four, or five, I don't remember. But she was a little kid and I'm thinking, oh God, and you know, leaving a kid full time in Joe's hands wasn't gonna happen. It would be Suzanne Bros, who was our au pair at that point in time. And so then I talked to my mother and told her what had happened. And she was worried. Why, why would you go to Auschwitz? Won't that be dangerous? I said, mommy, no, I have to go. I have to go. I can't be invited to be part of this delegation and not go. And so I went and in the diary from that trip, 
in the book. And it was the most amazing, amazing experience to be walked through Auschwitz to see the latrines, to see the bunks, the things that my mother had talked about and to watch that. And all of, all of a sudden, all the dignitaries from everywhere, from all the countries showing up at a time now that that can happen and did not happen when Auschwitz was Auschwitz people pretty much had nothing to do with that place. There was no bombing of tracks. And so I felt so honored to be there because here I was, Hadassah Freilich Lieberman, the daughter of my mother, a survivor of Auschwitz and Dachau. And I was able to represent the United States to represent my husband in the Senate. And my mother, my father had died. And this was a glorious day for me, time for me. I was in Warsaw on the way. First, we stopped in Frankfurt, Germany, which I had never gone to Germany. So that was an amazing moment. And once we, we were coming back from Auschwitz, we stopped in Warsaw. And I remember there were all kinds of feelings in Warsaw. And we were with Rabbi Avi Weiss and he had his talis on walking through the streets or coming from Shoal of Warsaw. And I was thinking, Oh, this is weird. I don't know. Should he be wearing his tallit? And I had a chance to look at how brave he was and how he wanted to do what he wanted to do. And we needed to be proud and accept his heroism. So it was an amazing trip. And I will never, ever forget that trip. And, um, we're coming up on the hour. I just want to ask about one more thing. In that Please. story, you talk about um, thinking about whether to bring back some soil um, oh. from Auschwitz, and then you, you make a different choice, which I thought was really interesting. Can you just tell us about that? Yes. Well, you know, it's always this bringing soil back to my father's grave, and I promised my mother. Then when I was in Auschwitz, and they were reviewing how these pulverized bones just from the dead was in the soil. And it was a giant grave of sorts. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to bring soil back to mommy of filled with that. I'm going to bring a stone back because a stone is solid. Nothing goes in, nothing goes out. And when I put that stone on my daddy's grave, it will be strong. It will signal that I just went to Auschwitz and brought this as a memory back to my father's grave. And that was my father's one concern all the time about Auschwitz. Who will say Kaddish out of all the graves, not just Auschwitz, everything else. Who will say Kaddish for these dead people who were barely buried? And I remember that was always a concern. So there I was putting the stone on his grave and saying Kaddish. Thank you, Hadassah. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you to Sylvia. Um, and thank you for giving us a taste of what a powerful and life-affirming uh, message the book contains. I'm gonna hold it up. Uh, the book is Hadassah, an American story. Uh, there's a link in order to be able to order it in the chat. 
And I just want to, to thank you, to thank Sylvia, your conversation partner, and to thank all of those who made this discussion today possible, the Hadassah Brandeis Institute, the Vilna Shul, uh, the Jewish Women's Archive, the Holocaust Museum of LA, and the Illinois Holocaust Center and Museum. Uh, we invite participants to purchase the book. There's a link there in the chat now uh, to fill out the survey and uh, to join us again. Uh, but thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate this very much, truly from my heart. We all did too. Thank you.